you can start. Okay. If, if, if the director and MR permits, can you start, sir? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to formally uh, uh, thank uh, Dr. David Sibley, who's our distinguished speaker for this morning. It's a great privilege and honor to have him uh, in this NIMR Mera series to give a talk on on infectious disease in general. But he's a world-renowned uh, expert on on toxoplasma, but also I would say on malaria and on epicomplexins in general. And he's the guiding light for infectious disease biology, at least in context of parasitic diseases like malaria and toxoplasma for a huge number of people all across the world. Um, so he's, he's trained. Uh, he trained people who are themselves who themselves become leaders in the field. So he's a he is a guru of all by all measures uh, of toxoplasma, and and it's a great great honor and, and privilege to be able to host him in this uh, lecture series. So I know it's a uh, little odd time, and he made an effort to go back to the lab to to do, because it's it's evening uh, in Seattle. So he's he's made an effort to go back to the lab and and deliver this talk. Which uh, which we are very proud to host. So thank you, uh, Dr. David Sibley, very much for this gesture, and uh, we are really looking forward to this talk. Sachin, yeah, thank you. So uh, before we start, uh, I mean, as director mentioned, it is it is well established that Professor David Sibley is a big name in parasitology. Uh, so uh, as 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 a trend, I would like to uh, you know uh, read a few lines about Professor David. Professor Sibley received a bachelor degree from Oberlin College in 78 and PhD in uh, 85. Uh, he also received further training in uh, National Hansen's Disease Laboratory, uh, followed by a postdoctoral study at Stanford University in 1988 to 1991. And he has gone to become a leader in the field of molecular parasitology. Uh, he has been quite uh, since 1991, which is quite a long time at Molecular Microbiology Department at Washington University of uh, an School of Medicine in St. Louis. Uh, he has uh, uh, he has been uh, 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 continually funded by his, his lab is fully funded by NIH and other uh, reputed grants. He has trained more than 60 graduate students and postdoctoral fellow. Uh, he has over uh, more than 270 publications in noteworthy journals and over 30,000 citations. Uh, he has uh, been a frequent reviewer for NIH grants uh, and Wellcome Trust grants. He also serves an ad hoc reviewer for Wellcome Trust, European Council of uh, European Research Council, DFG, and Swiss National Research Foundation. He has he is a past member of Scientific Advisory Council for Past Institute Paris and has been advisory board on Welcome Center for Molecular Parasitology at Glasgow. Uh, he has served as an editor for Science, Cellular Microbiology, PLOS Pathogen, PNAs, MBio, and is a member of other scientific editorial board in journals. Uh, he has been uh, the recipient of many awards and honors, including Borrow uh, Welcome Scholar Awards in Molecular Parasitology between 2000 to 2005. Alice and C.C. Wang Award in Molecular Parasit Parasitology uh, from American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in 2017. He was appointed as a Fellow of American Academy of Microbiology in 2007. Uh, Professor Sibley's achievements earned him acceptance into National Academy of Science in 2017. He was elected as a fellow of American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2019. So this is a short, short, very short bio, in fact, I would say, uh, of Professor uh, Sibley. And with this, I, I really warm welcome him uh, on behalf of National Institute of Malaria Research and uh, Mera India. And, and I invite him uh, for, this, for this talk. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you, uh, Sachin and Amit, for the kind words and the introduction. Um, I I'm going to talk today about uh, toxoplasmosis and um, efforts to develop new therapies. And, and I'm going to start by introducing the organism and the, some of the biology and, and the rationale for why we need new medicines for this organism. Um, it's not as uh, globally important as malaria and, of course, the work that 
NIMR is, is doing for malaria control and also for the recent pandemic for COVID probably overshadows some of these other parasites. But nonetheless, there are many uh, chronic infections caused by parasitic diseases for which we don't have good therapies. And so what I'll try to do is introduce some of the biology and then a couple of um, targets that we think have some potential for developing new inhibitors that might overcome some of the limitations of the current ones. So just to briefly go over the cycle of transmission and how humans um, become infected with this parasite, it's a parasite of, of cats and rodents, cats and mice. And in the cats, it undergoes um, the sexual development stages that give rise to oasis. So this is akin to the mosquito stages in malaria, but in this case, it's happening in the cat. The oasis are shed in the environment, they're highly resistant, and they sporulate, and then they're picked up by rodents or by many other animals, herbivorous uh, feeders. And these are very infectious. They last in the environment, and it probably only takes 10 or so of these to cause an infection. So in the mouse, they go through two phases of development, a fast-growing form that we call the tachyzoite. It's responsible just for disseminating to all the tissues. We'll look a little bit about how that happens. And then they switch to a dormant stage, which is found in muscle and, and brain. And it's, it's semi-dormant. It replicates very slowly. This is not exactly like the hypnozoite, but it's, it's a little bit similar in the sense of, of, of Vivax. It's a little bit similar in the sense that it becomes difficult to target with drugs because it's not very active metabolically or in terms of replication. This is the transmission stage though. So when the cat eats the mouse, it completes the cycle. And humans get infected by accidental ingestion of oasis or by eating undercooked meat. So many wild and domestic animals are infected with toxoplasma and they often are subclinically infected, but they have tissue cysts in the muscle and, and so they pose a risk uh, to individuals if they're consuming um, undercooked meat. The human is really a dead end in this life cycle. We're not typically involved in transmission. There can be transmission from mother to baby, but there's not person to person transmission. We're sort of an accidental host in this life cycle. So it, it's a foodborne pathogen. It can, as I mentioned, um, be ingested as, as part of the diet. And uh, it's in the US, the third leading cause of foodborne infection. There are lots of examples of waterborne infections, a couple notable ones in British Columbia and in Southern Brazil, uh, which involved contamination of domestic water supplies and then infection of um, thousands of individuals in a, in a focal uh, outbreak. And this is probably reflects the two major modes of transmission to humans. So what happens when people ingest either the tissue cyst from undercooked meat or the oocyst, uh, the parasite survives in the stomach, it exists and emerges, and then it can infect the small intestine. And it really likes the ileum in the small intestine as a primary place where it, where it enters the epithelium and replicates and it doesn't stop just in the epithelium. It'll cross that barrier and enter the lamina propria. And there it interacts with leukocytes, with dendritic cells and monocytes and interstitial cells. And uh, it's very good at infecting all types of nucleated cells. So it doesn't really discriminate what type of cell it's uh, infecting at this point. The sporozoites or bradyzoites that cause the initial infection quickly differentiate to the fast growing form. And then it disseminates from there. And it disseminates within leukocytes and it becomes really problematic. It goes to all the tissues in the body, but it becomes problematic when it crosses the blood brain barrier, gets into the CNS or into the retina or when it crosses the placenta. And so it's one of the few pathogens that can cross the syncytial trophoblast layer in the placenta and infect the developing fetus. And it's probably doing this by several routes direct migration across barriers, uh, growth within endothelial cells, and then emergence on the other side, and also migration of monocytes and dendritic cells ac across these biological barriers. Uh, globally, this is a very widespread chronic infection, and these studies come from a compilation of serological studies. Uh, this was put together a little more than 10 years ago, 
and it shows by country average prevalence, and these range from slightly under 10. So in China, there's a lot of variation, but between five and 20%, depending on the region, uh, 10 or 15% in North America, you can see India here, um, somewhere in the 20 or 25% range. But there's some countries in Southeast Asia and South America um, that exceed, and, and, and in Europe, that exceed 50%. So a, all in all, about a quarter of the world's population is chronically infected. So we take a, this evidence of serological positivity to indicate that the chronic infection is ongoing. And that's based primarily on animal model studies. So in the mouse, if you infect uh, lab mice, and, and the mouse is a natural host. So the lab mouse is a reasonably good model for what we see in human infection. They undergo uh, this fa fast growing uh, form that spreads very rapidly and the tissue burden goes extremely high during that initial phase. There's a very strong TH1 immune response that is mounted and that controls the parasite. And so the fast growing forms are rapidly controlled and they drop precipitously. And the parasite differentiates then into this chronic bradyzoite form. So those chronic stages persist for the life of the animal. So in the mouse, if you can keep a mouse alive for a year and a half or two years, it'll still have tissue cysts in the brain and in the muscle. Although they drop over time, they're still there. They likely undergo multiple rounds of emergence and reinfection. So it's not the original tissue cyst that's just staying there dormant, but there's a slow turnover of these stages. So we estimate about a quarter of the world's population is chronically infected. Most of these are subclinical infections, but it becomes a risk factor if you're immunocompromised. And so things like um, cancer chemotherapy, organ transplant, HIV AIDS, all predispose individuals to reactivation of these chronic infections because they can revert back to the fast growing form. And as I'll mention in the next slide, it's also a, a major risk for ocular disease in some parts of the world and for congenital infection. There's also an association with chronic infection and increased risk of schizophrenia and bipolar disease. So just two uh, examples to highlight the clinical importance of toxoplasmosis. This is a study that estimated the annual number of cases globally and the uh, associated loss in DALIs of the impact of these infections. And they break it down into different categories, both very early onset symptoms that would happen in the neonate and also the consequence of reactivation later in life where it might present with chorioretinitis, which is uh, uh, commonly seen as a consequence of congenital infection. Now, very surprising, uh, recently it's been realized that ocular infection in some parts of the world is a much more serious problem and it's not coming from congenital infection. It's adult acquired and it's happening in immunocompetent healthy individuals. So this is an example from Southern Brazil, but it's been documented in other parts of South America. There they feel the conversion rate of new infections is one to 2% a year. Five to 10% of those experience severe ocular disease. It can be, um, it can result in loss of vision, it can be recurrent, it's very difficult to treat. And this estimate from uh, a recent paper um, indicated that perhaps 30 million people in Brazil suffer from ocular toxoplasmosis for which the treatments are not very good. They can suppress the active infection, but you can't really cure the chronic state. And so these, these infections keep coming back. So why is that? The fast-growing tachyzoate forms are susceptible to the types of therapies that we currently use. Pyrimethamine and the combination with a sulfa drug is pretty good at blocking the replication of these stages. And sometimes clindamycin is used as an alternative therapy. The tissue cysts are a completely different matter. They grow very slowly, they rupture periodically and turn over, but they're really hard to target either with current chemotherapy or immune responses. So when the immune system fails and um, various uh, um, loss of various components of, of the adaptive immune system will result in reactivation of these bradyzoites, they can revert back to tachyzoites and then they grow 
in an unrestricted manner and cause lesions and pathology. You can imagine if this is happening in the retina or in the CNS, it can be quite consequential. So this is the rationale for why we need new therapeutics. Uh, we need things that will both block the replication of the acute phase, but either prevent the reactivation or simply eradicate the tissue cysts. And none of the current uh, therapies are able to do that. So, so why are they so hard to target? Um, we don't have a full understanding of the biology of these stages, but we do know that they replicate asynchronously and, and very slowly. This is an example of an image from a paper by Tony Sinai's group. And here they're looking at a marker for cell development or cell division within the tissue cysts. The green parasites are undergoing a process of daughter formation where they, they divide by binary fission. And so they're actively dividing. And at any given time, there are only a few of them that are dividing and most of them are dormant. So the, the turnover here is an order of magnitude slower than what you see in the tachyzoids. And it's asynchronous. They're not all dividing at the same time. The tissue cysts also reside in the central nervous system. So we also have the issue of the blood-brain barrier and having to get compounds that will get access across this barrier. So to be effective, inhibitors are going to act, have to act on a slow-growing, non-replicating cell and have a rapid cytal activity or be able to block the reactivation in some manner. So that's the, that's the goal of thinking about how one would make new therapies. So I'm gonna diverge now and tell you a little bit about a biological story that developed out of my lab, which ultimately comes back um, to try to think about how we would develop drugs that might target the chronic stages. So this starts with what we think of as the cycle that happens in the intracellular cycle or the lytic cycle. So when tachyzoites are replicating and they're expanding in the primary infection, their goal is to get into a cell and replicate and egress out of that cell and repeat that process until the immune system stops them or something stops them. So to do that, they've got a number of adaptations. They can display gliding motility on surfaces. They use that to cross barriers and to enter cells. This is driven by microneme secretion that allows them to attach to the substrate and attach to the apical, by their apical end to the host cell. They then penetrate the host cell using their actin myosin motor. So this is an active process. They replicate in a vacuole and then they egress out, which is also an active process that requires microneme secretion and motility. Those processes are under the control of a number of different uh, kinases. And the, the one I wanna highlight here is a family of calcium dependent serine threonine protein kinases or CDPKs. I was recognized uh, early on when genomes came online that AP complexins share this ancestral form of CDPKs with plants and green algae. And they differ from mammalian CAM kinase, for example, in that the calmodulin-like domain that is regulating the kinase is fused through a junctional domain to the kinase domain, where these are separate in CAM kinase. And there's a very nice uh, structural story about how this molecule becomes active on binding to calcium. It was solved uh, as an X-ray crystal structure by colleagues at the SGC. This is the, this is the kinase domain without the EF hand regulatory domain, but by comparing structures with and without the EF hand, with and without calcium, became apparent that there's this very elaborate activation mechanism where their activity is calcium dependent. And it also depends on this junctional region that plays an auto inhibitory role. So that's um, you know, very interesting from a mechanistic standpoint. A really interesting feature about CDPK1, which is one of the kinases in this family in toxoplasma, is that if you look at a position in the kinase that's called the gatekeeper, it's very unusual in that it contains a glycine. And this is not seen in other kinases in toxoplasma. Most of them have these very bulky hydrophobic residues, and that's typical of mammalian kinases. And in fact, there are no mammalian kinases with a glycine in the gatekeeper residue. So that struck our, um, our attention very quickly once we saw that sequence because there was a precedent for the gatekeeper residue and the role that it plays in susceptibility to a certain class of small molecules. 
So, uh, as I mentioned, the structure was solved by SGC. This is Ray Huey, whose team uh, solved the structures. And what they recognize is that the glycine gatekeeper makes this kinase susceptible to a class of molecules that are ATP mimetics. So, they have this pyrazolopyrimidine ring, which looks a little bit like a um, adenine ring. And here they have a, a bulky constituent. This one is 3 methyl uh, benzene, and it can fit into the ATP binding pocket because of that small residue of glycine. But if you mutate that to a methionine, it now will not accept this inhibitor. And so it's resistant to the effect of that inhibitor. Now, the background for this had been worked out in pioneering studies by Kayvon Shokat at UCSF. And Kayvon uh, was interested in chemical biology tools to study kinases. And so he took mammalian and yeast kinases and made them sensitive to these inhibitors by making mutations that introduced a glycine. And if you do that in the mammalian uh, genome, you can make a single kinase sensitive to inhibitors like NAPP2, where all the other kinases in the genome, in the proteome, are resistant to that inhibitor. And so that was used to study the function of individual kinases. We had a slightly different situation that we have a natural wild type kinase that has the glycine residue. And so it's sensitive to this class of inhibitors. And if we mutate it to methionine, we can make it resistant. And that's shown here. This is an in vitro enzyme assay where we're inhibiting the, uh, the wild type enzyme using increasing concentrations of this analog here. And if we mutate the glycine to methionine, it's completely resistant to inhibition. If you put that allele back into the chromosome, so now if you make this mutation in the parasite, you can switch them from being sensitive to these inhibitors to being resistant. So I'm gonna skip most of the data that went into this story, but ultimately we showed both by genetic knockdown and by this chemical biology trick, by inhibiting the kinase, using these selective inhibitors, that if you block CDPK1, you prevent microneme secretion. And this is critical for all of these activities of motility, cell attachment, cell invasion, and egress. And so there, it, it's, it's a very potent inhibitor because it's upstream of so many different biological processes. So we published this work together with Kayvon's lab and with Ray, um, and there were some structure papers that came out at about the same time. And we were very excited about that because we felt that this was a, a really important discovery that helped us understand the biology and it identified a really critical component in the parasite. Uh, the paper was published in Nature, and when that happens, your papers get a lot of attention, they get in the press, they get, uh, there was a Nature blog, they, they're, you know, they were on Twitter and so on and so forth. And so we, we felt pretty good about that. We felt like we had accomplished something that's important for basic science. What we didn't anticipate is that there were other people who read this work who had very different questions about what were the possibilities. And I, I got this email a couple of days after the paper was published from a woman in Heidelberg who's asking about her husband who had cerebral toxoplasmosis. Uh, he had recurrences because he was immunodeficient caused by a kidney transplantation. And therapy was not successful at that time. So, she asked how far or near is the possibility of human therapy, therapy based on your work. My husband is very sick and I'm looking for any help. So at that point, my elation at having accomplished this uh, important basic science discovery um, quickly evaporated when I, when I, of course, realized that I did not have an answer for her that would be a satisfying answer because what we had done was to take molecules that are useful for biology and to use them as probes, but they weren't drugs and they weren't designed to be drugs. They weren't designed to work in vivo. They didn't have any of the properties that one would like necessarily in a, in a drug molecule. And we hadn't even been thinking about that. We had just been thinking about how do you test the function of a kinase and show that it's an, an, an essential component. But we thought about it for a little while and I went back and talked to Ray and Kayvon and said, well, maybe we could do something with these molecules if we had some medicinal chemistry. And so we did that. We, um, together with Kayvon's lab, made about 200 compounds. 
I'm just going to show you the summary of what came out of that here. Um, this is the scaffold, and we realized from many different substituents on different parts of this that this component here sits in the hydrophobic pocket, which is where the glycine residue is. There's a hinge binding region that's critical for these kinases to bind in the ATP pocket. They also interact with the ribose binding pocket. And there were certain features of the molecule that we found that enhanced stability and avoided efflux and wound up giving us molecules that were now reasonably drug-like. They have reasonable IC50 and EC50 values. Uh, they don't inhibit human kinases. They have modest uh, stability in the mouse system, but very good bioavailability, and they get into the CNS, which is really important. They're relatively small molecules. So we also tested them for specificity. Here we've screened a panel of about 500 human kinases. Only one of them shows inhibition with this inhibitor. So it's really quite selective. Uh, this kinase is CK1 epsilon, and it's a non-essential kinase in the mouse. So they have a very clean safety profile, which is not the case for the original off-the-shelf compounds. We then put these in two models for toxoplasmosis, an acute model, which is shown here, and, and I'll show you in a minute, a reactivation model. This is an LD50 challenge uh, in the control. A number of animals die, they lose weight. They're protected if you give them the compound here for six days at the beginning of the trial. And you can see that also in this luciferase bioluminescence readout. In the control animals, the infections give an IP and it expands in the, in the perineal cavity and and disseminates, and eventually it winds up in the brain. So if you look at the mice here a little bit later, they all have CNS infection. And, and uh, the ones that survive all have CNS infection. In the treated animals, the infection is really confined. It doesn't expand or disseminate, and we don't see it moving into the brain. And in fact, if you go and look in the brain at later time points, the treated animals have much lower cyst burdens. So here the compounds are acting in the acute phase, preventing dissemination, and so they prevent seeding of the brain, and that's how they're reducing the chronic infection. Now we wanted to look in a different model to see the effect on the chronic state directly. And so this is a model we call a reactivation model, and it mimics what happens in an immunocompromised patient. We take a mouse that's profoundly immunocompromised, interferon gamma receptor type one knockout mice, they are completely susceptible to toxoplasma infection. We infect them, but then we keep them alive by treating them with sulfadiazine. And sulfadiazine is very good at blocking tachyzoate replication, but it doesn't do anything to bradyzoites. So the mice wind up with a high tissue burden of cysts in their brain and, and skeletal muscle after a month of this treatment. We remove the sulfa, and then we watch them get sick or we treat them with compounds to see if we can prevent that. And then we can use bioluminescent imaging and of course look at other parameters of weight loss and survival. So here are one of the compounds from this series. You can see if, if animals are just taken off sulfa, they die within 10 days. If we treat them between day zero and eight with several different doses here twice a day, you can prolong the survival and more importantly, some of these animals are actually cured. And the, the treatment here is being given only in the chronic phase. So it has to do two things. It has to prevent the replication of the tachyzoids, but it also has to eliminate the tissue cysts. So as those tissue cysts are rupturing and giving rise to new daughter cysts, the compound has to eradicate that infection. Otherwise that animal is gonna die. We also showed that by bioassay, so we take the brain at the end of these 30 days, we inoculate it into another susceptible mouse and look to see if there's any residual infection. And in this trial, we cured about 25% of animals. So that's a reasonable uh, accomplishment given that the current standard of care uh, has no ability to cure animals in, in this type of infection. And you can see the effect of sulfadiazine, for example, if you put it together with pyrimethamine, looks exactly the same. The animals don't make it past the initial 10 or 12 days. So this is, this is one example of a target-based screen um, where we've advanced some compounds and they have reasonable properties. Now, there was still a lot of work to do at this point. Um, and so we went back and made another 400 compounds. 
and I'm not going to show you the entire uh, series of those, but I want to just make a couple points. One is that we only changed a few things. So you have this CF3 group here in the glycine pocket. You have a, a pyridyl now, so there's a nitrogen in this ring instead of a carbon. And then we've changed this substituent here to cyclopropyl. Why did we do that? Um, to improve properties for ADME. So reducing toxicity to host cells, improving metabolism. Uh, we retained a good oral uptake. We were able to avoid toxicity on host enzymes, not just kinases, but a, a large panel of different enzymes, including channels, things like HERG. There are also AIMS and micrococcal nucleus negative. They have low CYP uh, inhibition and good CNS exposure. And importantly, we, we actually retained or even improved the efficacy against the enzyme and against the parasite. So that's important if you wanna have compounds that are moving from preclinical into clinical. This is a late stage preclinical candidate. Um, it still has some room for improvement, but it, it does pretty well. These compounds, these improved compounds behave similarly in the mouse model. And I'm, I'm not gonna show you that data because it was published recently. So we're not the only ones that have worked on CDPK1. And um, this is a study from Wes Van Voris uh, at University of Washington. Uh, they, again, uh, developed compounds based on this scaffold. Theirs look a little bit different. They have a direct bis arrow linkage here to this naphthalene ring. And they're dosing their animals in a little bit different way. These are chronically infected, immunocompetent mice, and they're just treating them for 14 days after they have an established infection. And what they can show is that the compounds greatly reduce the burden of tissue cysts. So again, they're acting on the chronic stage. And I think this is further evidence that this is a reasonable target, probably because cysts are turning over and they're using CDPK1 during that process of either rupture or reinvasion. And uh, treatment during that window has the ability to reduce the chronic infection. So I want to talk about something a little bit different, which is a phenotypic screen. So we, in the previous study, we started with a target and we just started making molecules that we knew had a chance of inhibiting that target because we were fortunate enough to have a lead compound. Now that's not always the case. Um, and so one of the strategies that's often used is to do phenotypic screens where you just screen for parasite growth inhibition. And we did this with the Broad Institute, and I'm highlighting uh, Stuart Schreiber here. Uh, his team was instrumental in helping us do this, but also his team um, developed a, a library of what's called diversity-oriented synthesis compounds. These are compounds that have increased sp3 hybridized basic amines, uh, greater stereogenic elements. Uh, they sample a larger three-dimensional space in chemistry than conventional libraries. And, and these were mixed in with about 70,000 additional, uh, 70,000 total compounds, including about a, 100 actives from uh, prior antiparasite screens. So here I'm just showing you the top 50 or so um, in rank order based on their EC50. And one of the things that popped out of this right away is that some of the DOS inhibitors are some of the best inhibitors here. Um, Pyrimethamine kind of falls in the middle. DHODH, which some of you may be aware of as a malaria target, there are a number of compounds that target this uh, enzyme in pyrimidine biosynthesis. Um, and they're only modestly effective against toxo. But the VRS series turned out to be the most potent ones. And that of course caught Stewart's attention and we quickly learned about what that meant. Um, and this is data that comes from a paper on malaria and I think um, Dr. Sharma's group was instrumental in, in doing some of the work that I'm gonna show here and in the next slide. Um, first, just to talk a little bit about the scaffold. So one of the things that's really unique about these DOS compounds, this one here has at the core an azetidine ring that has three chiral centers. So there are eight different conformers of this molecule. And one of them is shown here in this green stick diagram and you can think about these as being sort of a folding chair that as you change the stereochemistry, it's basically sampling all the space around that central ring. If you then screen all eight conformers against the malaria enzyme or against the parasite in growth, two of them are very potent 
and the others completely lose potency. And so that, that geometry is really critical to the binding of this compound to the target. 7929 is highlighted here because it's one that came up in our screen and it's one that was, again, highlighted in the malaria work. So this uh, group went on and they evolved resistance to this one of these compounds in the, in the, in the series of these lines were then sequenced. They identified mutations in FRS, which is phenylalanine tRNA synthetase, and they're in the alpha subunit. And here they're mapped on a, on a structure, this I believe was from a homology model, sitting around the active site. These were also uh, confirmed to be important for the resistance that's seen in the enzyme here in this in vitro um, assay. So a follow-up and recent paper, again from Dr. Sharma's lab, reveals the structural basis for why these inhibitors are potent and why they're selective for plasmodium or apicomplexins over human. So here you can see the EC50, uh, the IC50 curve for human and a mutant of plasmodium. It's one of these mutants that was in the previous structure that's highly resistant to these compounds. And then um, sensitive lines for falciparum and also for vivax. This shows the binding then of the compound into the active site. In purple here is the phi for the phenylalanine site. In yellow, this molecule is the ATP binding site. So this is a phi bound to AMP. And binding of the green compound, this is one of the compounds in this DOS uh, series blocks the phi binding site, displaces the ATP, and importantly, it has this auxiliary site, which really stabilizes and probably explains the high potency of, of binding to the enzyme for the parasite. And in other details in this paper, they reveal structural differences between the host and the parasite that allow for that almost hundredfold selectivity between human and parasite. So knowing that, we went back to toxoplasma and we screened a bunch of these inhibitors. This is just showing a small set here um, and compared the EC50 for toxo to that of two other apicomplexins, P. falciparum and C. parvum. So um, the Schreiber group also collaborated with a number of investigators studying cryptosporidium and showed that the same series of inhibitors um, provide very good inhibition of VRS in C. parvum, and they also work in animal models. So these inhibitors are acting against multiple different AP complexins. And the implication is they have a common target. This correlation of EC50 suggests a shared target. If we do the stereospecificity test with the eight different conformers of, of one of these uh, compounds, again, we see highly potent activity against toxo and plasmodium with the same two conformers. So to validate that, we did a similar kind of approach to what was done in the malaria work, and we evolved resistant populations of toxoplasma just by growing them in increasing concentrations of the drug. We sequenced these pools, identified mutations in VRS, and then showed that the pools have shifted EC50s, as you might expect from these growth curves. So they're shifted by either 10 or almost 100 fold. And then if we map the mutations that we identified back onto a homology model that was provided here by uh, Sunny Sharma at ICGEB, we can see that they overlap with the plasmodium ones. So this set of residues in particular are analogous residues. So they don't have the same numbering because the length of the enzyme or the protein is different, but these overlap completely in the crystal structure and lie very close to this phenylalanine um, adenylate binding site. And then the other re residues that we identified as toxoplasma mutations map to very similar regions in the molecule, which is consistent with the idea that there's a shared pocket between apicomplexins that mediates the sensitivity to these inhibitors. So to validate those, we went back and we made the mutations in the enzyme and tested them in vitro. And this was done by Peo Mittal at ICGEB. And you can see again, this shift up to a hundred fold in sensitivity depending on the particular mutation that's introduced. These are parallel then if you put those mutations back into the parasite. So this is done by CRISPR-Cas9. We're editing individual residues on the chromosome and we can show that 
the mutation is sufficient to confer that high level of resistance that was seen in the original pool. And this provides evidence that VRS is the primary target of this class of compounds in toxoplasma. So what about their activity against bradyzoites? I'm gonna show you a couple of assays for um, bradyzoites that we do in vitro, and then again, the mouse model. So this is an in vitro differentiation assay. If you take parasites and stress them by growing them at high pH and low CO2, you can induce the expression of bradyzoite wall carbohydrates and glycoproteins, and, and also proteins that are on the surface of the bradyzoite that are stage specific. This happens within three to five days, and then they gradually mature over time. So here we're going to induce for three days and then treat for two days, and then look at the size of the cyst. And what we see is that these compounds, and we're using 7929 to highlight these, but they block the expansion of the bradyzoites in the very early phase of differentiation. BAG1 is a protein that is highly upregulated on bradyzoites. So they, they're allowed to switch for the first three days and then treat it and they stop replicating. So the cyst size is greatly reduced when you treat with, this is just four different compounds from the series treated at either EC90 or three times the EC90. Another assay, which is a little bit more uh, biological because it represents a mature bradyzoite that's coming out of tissue, comes from harvesting tissue cysts from the brain of mice, and these are percol purified, and then they're liberated in vitro. We treat the bradyzoites either with constant treatment or just for four hours, and then we wash them, and then they're put onto monolayers, and, and we allow them to grow, and they develop as plaques over a period of 10 to 14 days. So we're looking at the outgrowth after treatment, whether it's constant or washout, and during that outgrowth, they switch back to tachyzoites. So we're really looking at whether the initial treatment is sufficient to block the outgrowth. With 7929, if we treat at EC50 or EC90, the EC90 is effective if it's left in continuously, but not when it's washed out. But if you increase that to about three times the EC90, even a four hour treatment now, they don't survive. So that's effectively a cytal activity if treated at sufficient concentration for four hours. So then if we go uh, to the mouse model, um, and again, I'm just gonna show you the reactivation model. These compounds work very well in the acute model of infection, uh, but here we're doing this interferon gamma receptor knockout mice, mouse. It's kept on sulfur for 30 days. They develop a chronic infection in the brain. We then treat them with compound after removal of sulfur, and then we look by imaging and survival to see how they progress in terms of reactivation. So in, this, in these mice, first of all, we did uh, PK studies with repeated dosing to see what sort of tissue levels we were able to attain. Um, a little bit disappointing, the plasma levels are not particularly high. They don't actually reach the EC50. And here we're plotting free plasma levels, so non-protein bound. And this is after oral administration in this case, we're doing 10 milligrams per kilogram, and we're doing it repeatedly over a four-day course. Now, the tissue distribution looks a lot better. This is a compound that has a high volume of distribution, so it concentrates in tissue, and particularly in the brain, you can see that it exceeds EC90, and it even gets up above three times the EC90 over the course of this treatment. So it has a favorable profile because of that. It's able to prevent, so eight day treatment here is able to delay the onset of death in these highly susceptible animals. And in one case, it actually cured the animal. Again, presumably by completely eradicating the tissue cysts because these animals are so susceptible that if any tissue cysts are left, they will reactivate and ultimately lead to death. So I'm just gonna summarize the two uh, potential targets here and what we know about them. CDPK1 is uh, fortuitously has a natural glycine gatekeeper, making it sensitive to these ATP analogs, pyrazole or pyrimidine derivatives. Uh, this is unique among kinases, so it's a, it's a nice feature to be able to exploit. The kinase is essential for a number of activities in the parasite, including in turnover of bradyzoites in the brain. VRS is sort of a different strategy, 
This is an enzyme that's going to be involved in protein biosynthesis. It's essential in tachys and also in the bradyzoites. The enzyme is substantially different from the human host. And we have this uh, great series of compounds that are potent inhibitors of PRS. They have cytal activity at the appropriate concentration. And this is a conserved target across apicomplexins. Both of these inhibitors in the toxoplasma model show good efficacy against acute infection and modest protection from reactivation. There are some remaining challenges though. Um, the current rate of cure from these compounds is relatively low. And we'd like to see that above 50%. And obviously for something to be clinically uh, useful, the cure rate would need to be pretty high. We haven't investigated things like combination therapies, but that's another potential avenue to see if adding these together with pyrimethamine and sulfa might give us a, uh, an additional boost. So I'm gonna close there and just acknowledge the collaborators. Um, the more recent study with Dr. Sharma's group at ICGEB is a, is a collaboration actually between Broad Caliper and our uh, group, and it's uh, currently supported by the NIH. And then, as I mentioned, the, the CDPK work was a collaboration started with Kayvon Shokat, and it's still continuing with Jim Janaka at my university. So I will stop there and I'd be happy to take questions. Many thanks, sir, for your uh, excellent talk. And I know you summarized in, uh, you know, in a limited time. And uh, we are really grateful uh, for your talk. And we have a few questions here. If uh, you allow, I can I can read these questions. So one, uh, the question is on CMPD24. The question is, how specific is this molecule? Um, this is the compound that inhibits the CDPK1. So we know that it's quite selective in terms of the kinome. It doesn't target other human kinases. We've not we know that it doesn't have a calcium channel like Herg activity. We've not investigated a wide panel of other human enzymes. So that's a, you know, something that should be done. The compound is, uh, in terms of other parasites, it doesn't act on other CDPKs that have bulky gatekeepers. So see, the nomenclature is a little confusing on CDPKs, but CDPK1 in toxoplasma um, is, is an ortholog of CDPK4 in plasmodium. So they're, they're very different and they're operating in different biological stages, in fact. And CDPK1 in plasmodium, which has been the focus of some efforts to develop inhibitors for, is not sensitive to this class of compounds. So it's, it's really, in this case, these are very selective for glycine gatekeepers. Okay, um, uh, next is uh, about bradyzoids and, and uh, YVX hypnozoids. So question is how closely these toxobradyzoids and YVX hypnozoids are related? I think they're not that closely related. Um, so the hypnozoid we think is, you know, is really uh, latent, you know, it's just not doing much at all. There are very few genes that are even transcribed. It doesn't replicate until it at some point reactivates. Bradyzoites undergo slow turnover. They are replicating. It's just at a very slow rate. And, and so what we have done is uh, thought about using uh, primaquin and, uh, and some of the more recent derivatives that are active against hypnozoites. Now, if you do those experiments in vitro and just look at replicating tachyzoites, the compounds are not very effective. What we have not done is to try them against these chronic stages to see if maybe they have something in common. But I, my suspicion is the biology is really quite different, but they're, they're serving a somewhat analogous role in that they allow for long-term chronic infection, which can reactivate at a later time point. The hypnozoid in Vivax, of course, it's happening in the liver stage and it's before the 
the big expansion that would happen in red blood cells. And here in Toxo, it's kind of at the other end of this, the cycle. It's happening after the acute phase is over as a way of just sustaining chronicity. So I think probably the biology is going to be very different. Okay, uh, uh, I am. I am glad to see that uh, Dr. Manjurahi. Uh, she is a senior scientist at ICMR headquarters, and she is officer in charge for vector borne diseases overall in India. She is with us, and she she would like to ask some questions. Dr. Rahi, can you ask your questions? Yes. Uh, good morning, Dr. Sibley. Thank you for a wonderful talk, and uh, this was very stimulating for me personally because. Uh, I also coordinate the area of zoonotic infections in India, the research part of it. And uh, today I was just thinking why NMR is talking about toxoplasmosis, but anyway, it serves my purpose and was very happy to hear this lecture. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Coming directly to the question, uh, India has a huge burden of uh, these, they are called as torch infections. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows about it and they are especially of interest for the uh, pregnant, pregnant women in India. Because in any way, the, the burden is so, the population is so huge in India, we are not even looking at it in the non-antenatal uh, people. And uh, so these infections in pregnancy lead to very poor fetal outcome, like congenital uh, anomalies and deafness and microcephaly and mostly deaths, stillbirths or neonatal deaths in India. So my direct question is, like uh, you talk, also talked about therapeutics. And once a woman is being diagnosed that she is positive by IgM or, you know, uh, she, she's carrying the infection, is there any way to predict the, uh, the effect on the, on the unborn uh, child on the fetus or how to prevent, is there any therapeutics to prevent the impact of this infection on the child, on the unborn child? And even in the, you know, after birth or we could predict what 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 can be the impact on the fetus, like deafness or congenital anomalies of brain, like microcephaly and all these. And my next question also was on diagnostics, because these are only very these TOSH tests are available only in very few selected urban areas. I remember it taking it myself during my pregnancies, but the larger part in the rural areas do not have access to their diagnostics. Can there be a possibility of a field diagnostic for toxoplasmosis at least? Because there's a high prevalence. So what I was just quickly reading through the studies, 15 to 25 percent pregnant women had antibodies for toxoplasmosis. Thank you. Yeah, these are um, these are excellent questions, and certainly you need to do studies in India to understand the burden and the, the specifics of the epidemiology there. I think it varies by country. Um, we, you know, the ocular disease we see in South America is very different than what you see in Europe or in, in America, the strains are different for one. Um, but in terms of congenital, there's the general pattern that you see, and this is based on literature from mostly from Europe and, and North America, which have very similar strain types, that, that is probably a key component. Uh, but what, what you see is that if the infection happens early in pregnancy, in the first trimester, it's going to be much more severe because the fetus is still developing and there's just many systems that are more impacted. So the chance of it crossing the placenta is lower in the first trimester because the placental barrier is still really intact. But as, as the pregnancy goes on, the placental barrier is less uh, intact in the late, like in third trimester. And so if a woman is exposed then, she's more likely to transmit the infection to the developing fetus, but it's less consequential because much of the development has already taken place. So there's a sort of inverse relationship between when you get infected and how severe. Time, you know, determining when a, when a woman gets infected uh, during pregnancy is very difficult. The French have done a pretty good job of this. So I would look at the literature that they've developed they test uh, every trimester, and so they're looking for conversion, and then they're doing amniocentesis and lots of counseling. Uh, it, it's pretty involved. It requires a lot of clinical follow-up. There are no easy ways to predict the the severity or the you know the consequence, the likelihood of a child being born with that's you know largely normal versus one that's going to have very serious consequences. So it's really difficult. Uh, in terms of therapy, 
There are really only two things out there that have been that are approved. Uh, in Europe, they use spiromycin, and they they feel that it may do some good and it doesn't do any harm. There's actually no controlled trial that's ever been done that shows that spiromycin works. But there are these um, anecdotal sort of open trials where where individuals just get enrolled because their physician refers them, and then some of them go on spiromycin. There seems to be an improvement. It just hasn't been done in a controlled setting. And then uh, Reba McLeod has shown that late in, in third trimester, you can actually use pyrimethamine. So pyrimethamine is contraindicated early in pregnancy because it's teratogenic. And, but at late trimester, you can use it and you can, you can also treat newborns with it. And they do that in a number of cases. They'll treat newborns and uh, they feel that there's improvement in things like calcification, cranial calcification, hydrocephaly, um, number of different uh, metrics that they've used. And, and these, are, these are kids that are pretty severely uh, affected when they're born. And so it's worth the extra risk of treating them. They treat them for like a, the first year of life. And that was published by Rima McLeod and her colleagues as something they call the Chicago Baby Study. And it's, she's located in Chicago and they had a lot of cases referred there. Um, in order to, to build that up. So the, those are the two examples I know about, but I think there's a huge unmet need to do exactly what you're suggesting, which is diagnostics and then follow up to predict what the severity is. And we really don't have good treatment for pregnancy. Okay. Uh, 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 next question is, uh, uh, is from, uh, is from Dr. Srinivasa Reddy, and he's asking lead compound with cyclopropyl compound in CDPK1. This is very interesting with good PK. However, a CNS and plasma ratio is approximately one. Do you think it is better to improve more towards brain? Yeah, this compound. Uh yeah, maybe if we had something that had a higher tissue distribution, we could increase the CNS exposure. Um, I think that getting it around one was pretty good. The biggest liability we see in these compounds, and this is something that's just sort of intrinsic to the mouse model, is they have a high uh, turnover. So the, the half-life of turnover from metabolism and excretion here is uh, two and a half hours or so. And so what happens when you do PK on these compounds, you see that they peak and then they fall. And so getting them up and getting them to sustain at a reasonably high level is, is challenging. And maybe that could be solved by having a higher tissue distribution or by um, additional modifications to prevent metabolism. So we, we did some metabolite ID on these compounds. And so we know what some of the weak points are in the molecule, where they're getting uh, modified by oxidation and glucuronidation and secretion. And so that I think the next phase of the chemistry is maybe to try to improve stability. But I, I like the idea if you could concentrate, usually you don't want to concentrate drugs in the CNS, but here this, these have a pretty good safety profile and our target parasite is in the CNS. So that's where we need to go. Okay, uh, are MT ETC inhibitors like Atpokumin or others used against malaria parasite effective against latent toxoplasma? Uh, yeah, I have a slide here at the very end. I, I was hoping somebody would ask this. Um, so what about just taking anti-malarial compounds and seeing if they work on toxoplasma? Uh, we tried this, and this was done with Jeremy Burroughs at MMV, he gave us about 90 malaria drugs. So these are things that are actually in the clinic or late stage candidates that are candidates for going into the clinic. And we tested them against toxoplasma. Now this is tachyzoites, so that's a caveat here. Um, and and they're, they only have modest activity. So four amino and eight amino quinolones, not really effective. Artemisinin and its derivatives have modest activity, but they're almost a hundredfold less potent against toxa than they are against plasmodium. 
And that may reflect, that may be because toxoplasma is not ingesting hemoglobin and it doesn't have high heme concentrations. So it's, it doesn't have, um, you know, heme that's there to activate the, the artemisinin. And then, um, you know, there've been a number of, number of other compounds advanced for malaria, ATP, ACE4, PI4K, cladosporin, and analogs. And the current ones that we've tested only have modest activity. So I, I might have missed the compound you asked about, but I, was it one of the artemisinins that the question was? Right. He was asking for atovaquone. Atovaquone. Um, atovaquone is not, uh, it is in this series. It's not highlighted on the graph. Atovacone has modest activity against toxo. It has been used clinically in, in uh, salvage therapies for immunocompromised patients. Unfortunately, it's really easy to get resistance to it. And that probably has happened in the clinic, although it wasn't confirmed, there were treatment failures. Yeah. So as a combination, it might work, but it, as, as a single drug, it's, uh, it seems to have some issues. Sachin, can yes. I can I ask yes, a couple of yes, questions? Yes, please. So, Dr. Sibri, I just have two brief questions. Um, um, first is, are there reports that SARS-2 infection uh, triggers release of uh, of dormancy in, in toxo infections? Um, uh, it's an interesting idea. I'm not aware of that. We we have done one set of studies with uh, a colleague here who has a mouse model for some um, mouse adopt, adapted isolates of SARS-CoV-2. And the, so co-infection with toxoplasma, we have chronically infected mice and then we challenge them with SARS-CoV-2. Um, you do see that there's an impact on the viral infection and it's, it's decreased in fact, um, but what we're still trying to figure out is if there's a reactive, are we reactivating the latent toxoplasma infection? And this is ramping up some type of immunity that then yeah. controls the virus. And so we're, we need yeah. to repeat those and, uh, and look at that. Yeah, I mean, that could be very interesting also in context of the question asked previously, where it seems in India and wherever surveys have been done, the prevalence of uh, antibodies against toxo may be at 10, 15%. So this could be an interesting study to look at for infections, uh, yeah. even for India. The second brief question I had was that, uh, and I mean, it's probably not a straightforward uh, first answer for that, but, you know, usually when we do phenotypic selection, we, we, we tend to identify a target. Um, however, is there space for a second or third target? And is there a, are there methods to address that issue? Um, because that might be, well, might open up new chapters, uh, I think. You mean like in our phenotypic screen, did we find compounds that maybe have a different target that are not VRS? Yeah, so yeah. if you took VRS, for example, any of the potent compounds, I mean, of course they have nano, nanomolar EC50s, et cetera, but that's when you, you know, you know there is, you're assuming or on the whole, the evidence indicates there's one primary target. Yeah. But if you were to take resistant cell lines or somewhat resistant cell lines and continue to select, would you then try possibly pick up second targets or third targets, which, because, you know, some of these compounds, even the case for CDPK, that's an ATP analog, essentially. I mean, there are literally, literally hundreds and hundreds of enzymes with the, which bind ATP. Yeah. Um, well, that's an yeah. interesting idea. When, when you do this selection experiment with the CDPK inhibitors and, and you ramp up the concentration, you get mutations in MAP kinase, in a MAP kinase that's essential for the cell cycle, and it's probably a second, uh, a second target for the this pyrazolopyrimidine class. Those kinases have serine or threonine in the, which is a, an intermediate size gatekeeper. Yeah. So they have an intermediate sensitivity. Interestingly, you never get mutations in the glycine residue, and that's puzzling us. That like, for, we can make them but you don't get them yeah. natural. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen that with the VRS inhibitors. Um, they, you know, they, they pick up that one dominant mutation that shifts a hundred fold 
And that's come up a couple of times. And then there are a number of other mutations in the pocket which give you low level resistance. We haven't, maybe we haven't looked hard enough though in the genome to see if there, is there another target somewhere? Um, We could go back and and look at that again. There are also compounds that come up in this, in this screen, the azetidine two carbonitriles, the target of these is unknown and they're potent against leishmania and also toxoplasma. And the, the group in Dundee has a hypothesis about the target in, in leishmania and it, I'm not sure it's the same in toxo, it may not be, but they're potent right. against both, both organisms. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. I think, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm done with that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sudhir. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, 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 thank you very much, Professor David Sibley. And I'm, I'm really grateful that uh, you have spent your, your valuable time, especially in the night. You are still in the lab. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you very much. I know, I know this is, this is, this is just because of time differences here. Otherwise, uh, uh, we were very excited to listen to you here. And uh, with this, I would like to invite you once, once this, I'm, I'm sure this pandemic situation would be over soon. I request you whenever you are in India, please, uh, please visit us at NIMR and yeah. we would like to hear you in person again. Yeah, it would be my pleasure and I've enjoyed it. Thank you for all the questions. It was really great. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. All right. See you. <laughs>